All right, so th this is an interesting topic to me, uh, partly because it, it's an area of, of research and, and career for me for quite a while, which is this whole idea of being able to look statically at applications and find out where are the vulnerabilities, where are the things that I worry about, and get them in front of developers in a way that just doesn't inundate, inundate them completely with noise. And part of the reason that I have such a passion for this is this whole idea of like the, the hamster wheel of doom, right? So. We have a hard job as AppSec practitioners to start with, right? Like we we have software getting more and more complex every day. We have new techniques that we have to stay out in front of. We have shifting behaviors and development teams. It's, it's a hard problem the way it is. And then we buy tools or we adopt open source tools and we wanna to try to find things for the developers to fix. We wanna find those risks so that we know them and we track them and we find so many. Right. And a tool sort of says like, hey, you have all of this risk and everything's on fire and it's terrible. And the developers are really, really frustrated because they're, you know, they're looking at spending many, many person years of effort to fix all of this stuff, even just to research it in a lot of cases. And so they start to kind of just get alert fatigue and they, and they kind of dismiss the risks. They start to devalue the, the tools. They say, you know, I don't want to use the security tool. It's not super valuable to me. It's not giving me information that I think is actually helping me ship software, you know, and, and have it be a good quality software. And that tends to bleed over into the team that recommended it, which is usually us in AppSec, right? So they start to be annoyed with us. We can make it harder and harder to, you know, to work with us, right? Because we're just seen as the sayers of no or the people who are dumping all this work on them. We miss our SLAs and KPIs, so we get less buy-in across the organization from our leadership. We get less funding. It's harder to buy the next tool, harder to fix the problem, and the problem keeps getting harder, right? And, and so we get stuck here kind of all of the time. And so to me, being able to have tools that really help cut through that noise and have techniques that, that help reduce the amount of security noise that you have to deal with as a developer and as an AppSec practitioner is really, really key to you know, being able to run an effective program. Essentially, we, we talk about reachability as one of the ways to get out of this problem. You've probably heard people talk about it a lot. And reachability can mean so many different things, right? Um, people, some people will talk about reachability as, you know, can an adversary exploit this from the edge of my network? Right? Is there is there a path to my application to something that's vulnerable? Some people will talk about it as you know, am I am I consuming the vulnerable component? Right? And th these all have value. I want to talk a little bit about kind of uh, Endor Labs viewpoint and what I think as a practitioner is kind of a gold standard of of where to get to, in order to really cut through the noise and focus your efforts on things that matter and kind of solve this whole developer frustration problem and break this cycle. And what what that essentially looks like is if you imagine that I have a piece of software, right? I have code that I or my developers have written, and there are functions in that code. That's the green boxes there that you see on the left, right? Those functions call things, right? This is kind of the, the one way of thinking about an application is there's a collection of these functions, right? And I'm consuming open source packages and private packages from other people, and I'm using all of these other functions that other people have wrote. And somewhere in this big morass of C, my tools have identified, hey, there's a package with a vulnerability in it. Now, I immediately have two questions. The first is, what part of this package is actually vulnerable? Right? Because it's not the whole thing. It has a vulnerability somewhere in it. So there is a function, typically it's one function, sometimes it's a handful, that is vulnerable. Somebody has to go and identify what is that function, where is the vulnerability, what is the problem? And then my immediate second question is, is anything I'm doing in the green box have a way to pass control over to this vulnerable function, right? And what I mean by pass control is it kind of looks like this, right? So I'm gonna start from the right and move left. So inside that vulnerable package, right, there's other functions that are calling the vulnerable function, right? So it's a chain of control. There's some other function that calls that. And then very quickly, I'm going to leave that package and there's gonna be even more functions in some other dependency that are using this vulnerable package, right? And they're calling it and each other, right? And then so on and so forth, all the way back to ultimately, I'm consuming a couple of things in a dependency that I've chosen. And my question then is, okay, I have this big map. And by the way, this may look a little complex. This is actually exceedingly simplified version of this. If you try to visualize this for any real world application, it's, it's not useful, right? Uh, we actually have a couple of blog posts where there's some screenshots from a visualization tool. 
and it's it's basically unnavigable because this can be so complex there's so many function calls in it in a real world application so now once i have a map like this which we call a call graph right so i have, I have a a map of what functions call what other functions i can start to ask questions about this graph and my my key question from a, a security standpoint is is anything in green is there a path that works from green to red. It's kind of like a Google Maps problem, right? Can I get to this city from here? And what do I have to go through to get there? And the answer is yes, I, we've actually found one path, right? So I know that I've written a function that calls this function, that calls this function, that calls this function, that ultimately calls a vulnerable function. That means that in the absence of any kind of compensating control, I have a real risk here that an adversary could potentially, any adversary that can talk to my application here could potentially exercise the vulnerability. Now there's some limits to this, right? So there could be things anywhere along this chain that make this harder to do. Uh, so for example, in some cases, exploiting a vulnerability requires that data be completely unsanitized or unescaped, for example, and maybe one of these functions along the, chi the, the chain does that. That kind of analysis is very, very slow and complicated. Um, and what we've found out is that something's north of 95% of the time, if it's reachable, it's also exploitable. Right, so it's a pretty good proxy that's much faster to get. And what this gets you is necessary context. Because what, what happens a lot of times when we're using security tools is we start to go like, I can't fix them all, so I'm just gonna fix the criticals and highs. And like as a practitioner, that has always bothered me because I look at it and go, okay, I know for a fact that if I fix all the criticals and highs, I will have wasted some time fixing stuff that there was actually no risk. Because like, if this path didn't exist, then I wouldn't care about the vulnerability because there's there's no possible way to exploit it. It, it. There's no path, you can't do it, right? And I also know there's probably some mediums and lows that I actually am really worried about that really do affect me that I'd rather be spending that wasted time on, right? So having this kind of context to get to what are the things that matter kind of irrespective of criticality, right? And, and severity is of course important for prioritizing, but like, I want to know where I need to spend all of my time. I don't want to eliminate real risk just because it has a medium label, right? So when you apply this as well as other context in analysis, like you can't use this by itself, uh, what you get is a, a kind of a filter, a sieve for what's important. And th these are real world results. This is from a real customer um, whose name I am not authorized to share. Uh, what we did is a, a, an entire scan across their entire infrastructure, and we identified 12,644 vulnerabilities. And with the standard kind of, let's do only criticals and high, it cut it down quite a bit, you know, a little over 30% went away, that are they're gonna be in the medium low bucket, but that's still like 8,750 things, right? And, and if, you, if you believe the research that says that you spend about eight hours a piece on these things on average, right? Some of them are 20 minutes, some of them are several days. Um, you know, you're talking about by the time you get all done, 70,000 person hours, more than that, right? Uh, of energy you have to do just researching it. It's not even necessarily fixing it all, right? And knowing that some of that effort is wasted, it bothers me a lot. So if you take it from less of a severity thing, you put, you put severity and likelihood down kind of at the bottom of your filter list, you can start with context things like, my first thing, if I'm gonna put this in front of developers to fix things, my first thing is, can you even patch it? Right, you can see that there is, you know, almost a thousand of these things, there was no patch available. What am I gonna ask my developer to do, right? Maybe if I have a very mature organization with with uh, you know, well staff, maybe my AppSec team can research what mitigations can I do for the things that aren't patchable. But I'm not going to talk to the developer until I've done that research, right? And then I want to filter out everything that's only ever used for testing. Like if a developer adopts a dependency and they're using it only to conduct tests, and that dependency is never going to go to production, it's pretty low risk. Right? It's only going to run in a pipeline where I've locked it down very carefully. It's never going to go out to the real world. The chances an adversary will have access to it to exercise it are very, very small. Nothing that I'm really worried about. Right? Now, you'll notice, like, if you kind of stop there, this affects production code number is pretty close to this criticals and highs number. Right? And we find this pretty, like, this pattern repeats quite a bit that, you know, this kind of reduction gets you 30 to 50% of your stuff goes away, right? On um, between these two things. These are particularly close in this case. So even with just using that context and not considering severity at all, you've gotten a similar work workload reduction as you as you did from getting rid of the mediums and lows, right? And you're already in better shape because you're focusing on stuff that matters and is actionable. But then when you do that kind of reachability analysis and you actually build a call graph 
and you analyze the source code or the binaries that, that something produces, and you find out, can I actually call the vulnerability from my code at all, it drops dramatically, right? So we, with that, and again, at this point, we haven't done any kind of like CVSS score filtering at all, right? We're just down to, does this matter to me at all? Like, is this even something I theoretically need to care about? And we're down to 2000 things, which is an 83% reduction in workload, right? That, that's huge, right? You're now talking going down from, you know, three to 30 to 35 full-time employees working for a year to fix all the criticals and highs down to three, right? Something along those lines. So like you've, you've already focused this a great, and now you can start your prioritization, right? And this particular customer said, the thing they care about more than anything else is the chance of exploit in the next 30 days. And we set a threshold of 3%. You, this, this kind of bottom filter is very much going to vary based on your threat model and your tolerance for risk. Um, but this was their decision and that reduced it even further so that now they're focusing their really precious developer time on the 6% of things that they as an organization have figured out are the most important. And the figuring out part cost almost no human time. It's almost all done by machines to, to sort this out. This is essentially like when I talk about context, like reachability is a key part of this. And I think it's a really important one. And this is kind of the process that we go to in order, in order to bring this capability and this context and this filtering to people. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about here is kind of on the left in step one, like we're going to do the analysis. We're going to actually look at code and context. All right, I'm, I'm taking you up awesome. on your invitation to interrupt. We have Perfect. two questions. Um, I'll start with uh, one from Gotham. Hello team, is this reachability analysis feature unique? from Endor Labs? That is a fantastic question. Um, there are a lot of vendors that talk about reachability. So Darren, why don't you talk a bit about, and I think the next slide that you had uh, gets into this a bit, which makes us unique. And I'll drop um, a resource that is related in the chat. Yeah, so it, it's, I wish we could just give you a straight yes or no answer to it. It's not quite that simple, unfortunately. So are there people who do this kind of reachability where they're trying to get out of the function level? Yes, it does exist in the marketplace. Um, we have the widest language support for this kind of reachability. And we have the, uh, like we wrote this program analysis from scratch, right? So uh, a lot of people are using, you know, existing open source tool there. Uh, you know, we, we look at, you know, some of the things we do here with this like enriched CVE database. You remember that one of the questions I had back here was, I need to know with confidence which function is vulnerable. To my knowledge, we are the only people who have a human being reviewing those results for every single thing that we do in our analysis. So when we're, when we're analyzing a dependency, we're not just letting a machine guess at where the vulnerable function is. We're, we're certainly using tools, but we're reviewing the results of those tools to make sure we have correctly identified the vulnerable function, which way lowers our error rate. So like there are a handful, there's a lot of people claiming it, a handful of them are actually doing it. And, you know, I'm biased obviously, but I think we're doing one of the best, most comprehensive analyses. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, I dropped a link in the chat to a blog. We had a, a guest author recently writing about the different types of reachability analysis. Um, you're gonna see a lot of people talking about it and uh, it doesn't always mean the same thing. Uh, the second question we have here is from Alex. Um, they ask, any stats available on how often a true positive vulnerability slips through the funnel and actually gets exploited, even though it was filtered out per the previous slide? And I think what they mean, uh, if you go forward one slide, Darren, um, is uh, filtered out by these various ways to, to prioritize. So unfortunately, to give accurate like statistics, we would have to have customers being willing to share incident reports and things like that. And information sharing is something that our industry struggles with. Um, so I, I don't have good, reliable stats for you know how often something might lead to a real world you know incident or event. Uh, what I can tell you is that for you know two things: one, anyone who tells you they have a zero percent like false positive, false negative rate, you should take those claims as if they're claiming they found cold fusion. I suppose it's theoretically possible, but it's so unlikely that you should be very, very, very skeptical, right? So I won't, I won't say here that we're gonna be 100% reliable, nobody is. Uh, what I can say is we've done a lot of care to make sure that what we're surfacing to people 
is stuff that matters to them most and that, they, and that people understand what they're filtering out because this this isn't just some filter that we put in blindly this is something we work with customers so that they really understand what things they're surfacing to developers and what things they're not and they have data on other things that they can go and review that if they need to so is there a chance that something that we marked unreachable actually is yes program analysis is not perfect the chance of that is relatively small and there's one really big reason why and the really big reason why is we don't just say yes or no we'll say yes no and you know what this was too complex to figure out because that's the real answer uh this has been a, a problem that it has been worked on for decades by computer science, being able to model a program um, without running it, and even with running it in some cases, is a very, very difficult thing. And there are going to be inaccuracies in everybody's approach. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to take an approach that minimizes the chance that we're gonna declare something as a negative when it's actually a risk to you, but nothing is nothing is perfect. Okay, and then uh, two more questions. Um, the next one is how often do you have to run the analysis uh, before pushing to prod once live? How often does this reachability analysis need to be run, be it daily, weekly, et cetera? Sure. So um, how often do you have to? Well, it, it's really kind of what you want to get out of it, right? So there's several different customers take several different approaches to this. Um, one is people run this on kind of every pull request because they, this allows them to set policy and make sure they can fix critical issues, you know, things that they define, defined as important before things ever have a chance of going to production, right? Um, not everybody's in a maturity place or has a, a model or maybe AppSec doesn't have the influence or control to, to implement that. So some people do daily or weekly scanning, uh, those kinds of things. One of the things that we do to kind of offset that, you know, you can't always scan on every merge and every pull request um, is that, we can do what's called monitoring. So if you scan something that's a potentially uh, releasable Git ref, right? So that would be like a release tag or a particular branch that's releasable, depending on how your organization works. Uh, what we'll do is we'll continuously monitor that for new risks to limit the frequency with which you have to scan. So if you scan something and one of the identified dependencies has a new CVE that's released, right? we're going to be able to alert you about that because we're monitoring for those changes without you having to do a rescan. All right. Um, next question, is there an automated, automated mechanism to patch the remaining patchable vulnerabilities and how will this impact any customer modified open source components? So the answer to that is not yet. Um, we do have some facilities to make developers' lives easier. So for example, we'll leave pull requests, uh, uh, pull request comments, I'm sorry, on pull requests uh, for certain things. This is controllable by the customer. So you can kind of tune this to what makes sense. So you can have your most critical thing show up as a, as a PR comment, say, hey, this needs to be fixed. Um, auto fixing can be a little bit hairy. Uh, you're, you're asking developers to give up some certain amount of control. And, you know, it's going to depend a lot on your organization and, and your tolerance for other risk for accepting that kind of thing. We are working on features that will add more automation to the patching process. Um, that's not ready for me to share a lot of details with yet, but, um, you know, stay tuned for that one. Okay, and then uh, can you install and run Ender Labs behind a firewall? Yes, absolutely. We need egress. And we need egress to one subdomain, which is our API subdomain. And all of the analysis happens on your end behind your firewall. And it's just results and like cache metadata that gets sent to our cloud. And those are all over HTTPS API calls. Okay, I think that's all the questions for now. We've got a little bit more time before uh... We've done the official end of the webinar, so why don't you move on to the next part? Yeah. So I, I wanted to just kind of quickly cover the the kind of context that we put around these things. So it's not just reachability, and I, and I think that the the excitement that we have in the industry about how cool reachability can be, um, and like pretty much everyone's either claiming it or trying to work on it, um, 
kind of overshadows this a little bit that it's a really powerful tool, but you can't use it in isolation, right? So what we're doing as an organization is we're looking at your code, we're looking at the context of the code. So things like, you know, is it test or not, for example, and we're building those call graphs for analysis in order to connect those to that same analysis that we've done across the open source ecosystem so that we can give you that high reliability reachability. But we're also working on, you know, we have all this really great enriched data. We're working on features to bring best upgrade path estimation and being able to evaluate the risk of those upgrades. So that instead of just going someone saying, hey, this is risky, please fix it. It can also say, hey, this particular vulnerability, this particular vulnerable package is risky and easy to upgrade. This one might be risky, but we also know it's difficult to upgrade. And you can use this to build policies around SLAs, to build, you know, to do resource planning, and to evaluate, hey, sometimes upgrading packages breaks things. So you can evaluate the risk to making those changes because the security risk doesn't exist in isolation, right? And at the end of all of that analysis, we're connecting that into, you know, we, we have this, we have talked a little bit about our rich CVE database where our our CVEs and other vulnerabilities and other risk information is aggregated and human reviewed by a, a research team. Um, and also that exploit probability that we subscribe to through EPSS, who does great work on statistically modeling the likelihood of exploit for a given vulnerability. And all of this exists to kind of map to these OWASP top 10 open source risks, right? That, you know, you have a whole supply chain problem. Having a tool that just says, hey, here's risk, go on doesn't really help you much. So we're trying to connect this back to things that the community as a whole has identified as supply chain considerations when they're adopting open source. So does anybody have any further questions, comments? Nothing yet. I see someone's asking oh. about S bombs. Absolutely, there we go. <laughs> um, I, I think I think good S bomb support is table stakes, right? If you're doing any kind of supply chain security, uh, especially if you're going to be in any kind of regulated or FedRAMP environment, you 100% need to support S bombs. Uh, we support import and export uh, of S bombs in common formats. Uh, we also support VEX generation, uh, which is a vulnerability exploitability exchange format, which helps you have vulnerability conversations in a computer readable form. It's an OASIS standard that's a companion to Cyclone DX. Really, really helps with the, the compliance aspect of using SBOMs. All right, let's take uh, this next question. We're planning on moving to GitHub Enterprise with advanced security with dependent bot, seemingly doing direct transitive dependencies with AI involved. Do we need another layer like Endor to further evaluate or check the risks further? So great question. Uh, we work really closely with GitHub Advanced Security. I'll drop some more info in the chat, but Darren, I'll let you kind of talk through the, the highlights. Yeah, Dependabot is a great like first tool for people to adopt. Like if you've never done any kind of SCA or dependency management stuff before, Dependabot is, I mean, it's very, very, seems like very magic. You kind of click a button and it's on, it's great, right? but it has some severe limitations, right? It doesn't do this kind of function level re reachability. Um, they are adding AI features, which are really compelling, but of course, with anything security related with AI, you have to compare it against like, hey, your error rate is gonna be a little higher because you know they have to have seen it before and you know AI still makes mistakes, like we're not there 100% yet. Uh, so Dependabot's a great base layer. We find that a lot of people, and this is one of the reasons we work so closely with GitHub Advanced Security, is you know we find that a lot of people with mature or large programs find a lot of value in either replacing or augmenting Dependabot with Endor Labs to get that prioritization and filtering. And uh, we integrate very closely so we can present to you the issues the same way that Dependabot does and things like that. All right, it is 9.28. Um, You're very welcome. I see in the Q&A, we've got some thank yous and some agrees. Um, gosh, we hit lots of good topics. Anything you want to hit on, Darren, before we start wrapping up? I don't think so in particular. Um, I, I just from as someone who comes from a practitioner background, um, I, I kind of just want to encourage people to, you know, uh, approach things as we, we tend to think of things as like, you know, the back to the hamster wheel of doom, right? Where we tend to think of things as, you know, let let me re, let me use a tool and let me get a report and let me do like 
no nobody outside of AppSec runs security that way. It's all event driven. So I really want to encourage people. It's something we've designed in. It's something others are starting to see the value of as well. Uh, to really kind of start treating these things not as reports that your developers have to somehow navigate, but as individual events that need to be routed to where people are already doing work. And I, and I think this is something we should be asking of AppSec vendors across the space, not just for like our little corner of the world. All right, I just dropped a, a link in the chat regarding our trial. We recently launched a full featured 30 day trial. So if you want to get in there and um, experiment a bit with the reachability techniques that Darren's been talking about, uh, you can do that right away. Um, there's two different ways you can do it. One is with our demo tenant that comes populated with a bunch of different languages and you can kind of mess around without any fear of breaking things or you can onboard your own projects and um, you know test it a bit more open-ended. So with that, uh, I think this has been a good conversation. Again, we're going to share this all via email so you can uh, come back and watch the video. And um, we have a, another webinar on the schedule for a month from now. The next topic is going to be artifact signing. So if you've been uh, by chance following our recent announcements, we're now doing some um, work in the CICD security area and um, in particular looking at cloud to code traceability with artifact signing. So we'll kind of get into the minutia of what is artifact signing and what can you use it for next month.